I'm Dr. Mark Catala, and I want to welcome you to the eighth chapter of the OpenStax Psychology Textbook. Today we'll be discussing memory, how it functions, what parts of the brain are involved, problems with memory, and ways to enhance it. But we'll start by asking, what is memory? And it's uh, the set of processes used to encode, store, and retrieve information over different periods of time. Now, encoding is how we get information into our brains, and so uh, how we get it into our, our memory system. And we, have, we can talk about automatic and effortful processing. So automatic processing is the encoding of details like time, space, frequency, and the meaning of words. And it usually takes place without any conscious awareness. So I could ask you, what did you have for lunch today? And that's automatic processing because you can just tell me what you had for lunch. Effortful processing, though, is encoding that requires a lot of work or attention. And so that's like when you're studying for a test. Now, one of the themes for this chapter is that material is far better encoded when you make it meaningful. And there's three different types of encoding, semantic, visual, and acoustic. And semantic encoding is the encoding of words and their meaning, which is what semantic means. And this comes from research that shows that when people recall a list of words, they tend to recall them in categories, which means that they paid attention to the meaning of the words that they encoded. Visual encoding is images and acoustic encoding is sounds. Now, when you encode images or mental pictures, it's easier than encoding words alone. So something like car or dog or book um, because they're high imagery words and they're concrete, they're easier to recall uh, because they're encoded both visually and semantically compared to something like level or truth or value. And that's what uh, Pavio called dual coding theory. Um, so you have both a, uh, I guess I should explain that a little bit. So you have um, both the semantic and the visual code for those words. Semantic encoding involves a deeper level of processing than visual or acoustic encoding. And Craig and Tolvin concluded that we process verbal information best through semantic encoding, especially if we apply what is called the self-reference effect. And that's the tendency for an individual to have better memory for information that relates to themselves in comparison to material that has less personal relevance. Well, storage is the creation of a permanent record of information, and the atkinson schifrin model proposed this idea of three stages of memory, so uh, sensory, short-term, and long-term memory. And their model is called the modal model of memory because it's the most commonly applied. And it's based on the belief that we process memories in the same way that a computer processes information. And so we can think, you can look at the graphic up to the right, we can think about this in terms of the flow of information through the system and the feedback loops that occur. And so, um, and so we'll go into more depth on this here in a minute. Now, Baddeley and Hitch proposed that storing short-term memories is like opening different files on a computer. And so they have memories in a visio spatial for, spatial form, as well as memories of spoken and written material. So the type of short-term memory that you have depends on the type of information you receive. And so they say this visuospatial uh, sketch pad, an episodic buffer, and a phonological loop. In the atkinson schifrin model, though, coming back to that, stimuli from the environment are processed first in your sensory memory. And that's a storage of brief sensory events, such as sights, sounds, and tastes. Now, it's very brief storage because it only lasts for a couple seconds maximally. And if we view something as valuable, that information will be moved into our short-term memory system. Your book talks about the Stroop effect at this point. Um, J.R. Stroop discovered a memory phenomena that you name a color more easily if it appears printed in that color. And that's something called the Stroop effect. So this is something that you can try. I've seen t-shirts with it too. But uh, it's easier, or it's difficult to say the name of the color rather than reading the word. And so um, this is really more of a demonstration of interference, though, between two competing responses. Uh, I don't know why they discuss it in sensory memory, but um, yeah, that's a difficult task. So I guess that's red, 
orange blue ah geez see i just screwed up too there's the stroop effect for you short-term memory is a temporary storage system that processes processes incoming sensory memory and it's sometimes called working memory and that's dory off to the right there who has some issues with short-term memory loss now short-term memory uh, usually lasts about 20 seconds and this comes from the research of George Miller, who was actually doing attention research. And he said that the capacity of um, short-term memory most people can retain is about seven plus or two, uh, minus two items. And so that's the capacity, seven plus or two, plus or minus two items. The step of rehearsal, which is the conscious repetition of information to be remembered, um, is used to move information from short-term memory to long-term memory and that's known as memory consolidation. So you can try to memorize a list of numbers uh, and in order, and that's called a digit span task. So you can think of this like trying to memorize somebody's telephone number. Most people can recall about seven numbers, and that's what Miller was talking about with seven plus or minus two um, items, and that seems to be our memory capacity. Long-term memory is the continuous storage of information, and it has no capacity limits, but not all of our memories are strong memories. So sometimes memories have to be prompted or cued, and long-term memory is also divided into two types, explicit and implicit memory. So explicit, sometimes called declarative memories, are memories which we consciously try to remember and recall. So we sometimes use explicit and declarative memory interchangeably. Um, it'd be like the material you study for your psychology test, like who was the founder of behaviorism? That would be uh, explicit memory or declarative memory. We can divide that up into semantic and episodic memory. So semantic is knowledge about words, concepts, and language-based knowledge and facts. So I could ask you a question like, What's the capital of Kentucky? Is it pronounced Louisville or Louisville? And it's actually pronounced Frankfurt. And this is like little kids jokes, so I apologize. Uh, you could ask, what's the biggest pencil in the world? Pennsylvania. Episodic memory is information about events which we've personally experienced, and it's sometimes called autobiographical memory. So people oftentimes remember their first kiss, or a trip that they took um, you know, from their past. Implicit memories are memories that are not a part of our consciousness. Um, they're essentially memories formed by behavior. And procedural memory stores information about how to do things. So how to brush your teeth, how to drive a car, um, how to tie your shoes, things like that. Retrieval is the act of getting information out of memory storage and back into conscious awareness. And I think this is obvious, but our ability to retrieve information from long-term memory is really crucial for everyday functioning. And there's three ways to retrieve information from long-term storage. So in recall, you can access information without cues. And so recall is like an, uh, an essay test because you have to remember the information. Recognition, which is like a multiple choice test, is when you identify information you've previously learned after encountering it again, because it involves comparison. So what's the right answer in a multiple choice question? Relearning is when you learn information which you've previously learned. And so this is like, uh, I studied French in high school and Russian in college. And if I tried to relearn those languages because I, I don't keep my language up, the, I would learn them faster uh, by, through relearning than I did initially because uh, I did know them at one time. So Carl Lashley explored the problem of where memories are stored in the brain. Is it just in one part of the brain or is it all, low, all over the brain? So what he did was he lesioned the brains of rats after they'd learned a maze in order to find an engram, and an engram is a group of neurons that serve as the physical representation of memory. Now, he wasn't able to find evidence of an engram, and so uh, based on his research findings, he came up with what he called equipotentiality <laughs> hypothesis. Not easy to say. And this says that if one part of the, one area of the brain involved in memory is damaged, another part in the same area can take over that memory function. 
So what are the areas of the brain involved in, in memory? Well, the amygdala regulates emotions such as fear and aggression, and it facilitates the encoding of emotional memories uh, at a deeper, deeper level. The hippocampus is involved in normal recognition memory and spatial memory, and damage to the hippocampus leads to problems. So specifically problems with creating new declarative memories uh, so it really seems to play a role in memory consolidation. The cerebellum is involved in creating implicit memories, and that's because people with hippocampal damage can still form new implicit memories, um, as long as their cerebellum is okay. And then with neurotransmitters, uh, we, don't, we don't really know what role they play, but they're likely to be crucial in memory consolidation. Arousal theory says that strong emotions trigger the formation of strong memories and weaker emotional experiences form weaker memories. And it's thought that this is due to the release of stress hormones. Um, flashbulb memories are exceptionally clear recollections of an important event. And so like the 9-11 attack, uh, the Kennedy assassination for people who are older and the death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt for people who are really old. But it doesn't have to be a national event. There's personal flashbulb memories that you could think of. So like your first kiss or losing your virginity or there's a lot of things like that. Problems with memory. Well, amnesia is the loss of long-term memory that occurs as a result of disease, physical trauma, or psychological trauma. And for example, uh, traumatic head injuries might trigger amnesia. And we can talk about anterior grade and retrograde amnesia. In anterior grade amnesia, you can't remember new information, although you can remember information from prior to the injury. And that's usually caused by brain trauma, and it's thought to be related to hippocampal damage. So you can remember uh, the far past, you just can't lay down new memories. Retrograde amnesia is the loss of memory for events prior to the trauma. And this is the way Hollywood oftentimes presents um, amnesia. So films like The Bourne Identity, where he can't remember his past. All he remembers is um, the future. Well, I guess you can't remember the future. <laughs> Memory construction and reconstruction. Construction is the formation of new memories and reconstruction is the process of bringing up old memories. The problem is that when we retrieve our, our memories, our older memories, we tend to alter and modify them in a couple different ways. So let's talk about suggestibility. Uh, this affects the misinformation um, from external sources that lead to the creation of false memories. This comes up often with witnesses to crimes and how they can be influenced and misidentify suspects in eyewitness identification. The misinformation effect paradigm, this comes from researcher Elizabeth Loftus. It says that after the exposure to incorrect information, a person may misremember the original event. What she did was um, she showed uh, people car accidents and then asked them how fast the cars were going, either when they contacted each other or when they smashed into each other. And people who were asked about the cars smashing into each other thought the cars were going faster. They, they misremembered um, seeing glass um, from the windshield on the ground. False memory syndrome is the recall of false autobiographical memories. And this was a big issue in the 1990s, um, repressed and recovered memory of molestation, that was a big issue. And people are on both sides of this issue, but mm, people who believe in repressed and recovered memory have mostly been discredited. So forgetting, that's the loss of information from long-term memory. And why does it occur? Well, it could happen through encoding failure. And that's because we never stored the information in the first place. And so how could we remember it? Transients is that memories can fade over time. So unused information fades. I was talking earlier about how I learned French in high school and Russian in college, and I don't remember much of either. Now, your book uses the example of To Kill a Mockingbird, and I can tell you too, as a Russian major, I read any number of Russian novels 30 years ago that I can only basically remember the title of. 
And the way to explain this is through Ebbinghaus, he came up with what he called the forgetting curve or forgetting function. And it's the, it says that there's a steep initial decline in what you can remember, but you can always remember some things. Absent-mindedness is a memory error caused by breaks in attention or focus, um, where your focus is somewhere else. So I did a visit event for the university that I work at for prospective students, so people coming to the university to maybe go here. And I put my phone down on a chalkboard and I just left it there because I was busy with something else. And then about an hour later, I was like, where's my phone? And so I had to go and it was still there. Blocking is when you can't access stored information. And that would be something like the tip of the tongue phenomena. So it's when you know the answer to something, it's on the tip of your tongue, but you can't come up with it. And this comes up often when you're trying to remember the names of a movie or a book or characters or something like that. If only somebody would invent a website to help resolve that. What about memory distortion? Well, there's three errors of memory distortion. One is misattribution. And this is when you confuse the source of your information. Now, uh, my dad would do this all the time and it endlessly amused me and my friends. What he would do is he, he liked to read historical fiction books and then he would talk about events from the historical fiction like they really happened in reality. And so we would always question about that. And if there's any Quentin Tarantino fans listening, please realize that Hitler did not die in a fire in a movie theater that happened in a movie. And so that, that's not really how he died. Suggestibility is very similar to misattribution, except that someone else plants the false memory, like a therapist or a police officer. Bias, there's several different ways our feelings and views of the world can distort our memory. And so your book talks about things like stereotypical bias, where we use stereotypes, or, or the hindsight bias, which we talked about in a previous chapter. Persistence is when you can't get something out of your head and it interferes with your ability to concentrate on other things. So in persistence, you have intrusive thoughts that make it difficult to concentrate on um, other information. And it's the, it's, the intrusive thoughts are usually something traumatic or unpleasant that you've witnessed. Uh, interference is when information is stored in our memory, but it's inaccessible for some reason. So proactive interference um, is when older information hinders the recall of newly learned information. And this is like when they make you change your password all the time. And then you can't remember your new password because it's your, your old password is interfering with it. Retroactive interference is when information learned more recently hinders your recall of older information. And I'll use a personal example of this. I was a big fan. I grew up in Cleveland. I was a big fan of the Cleveland Indians, which is the baseball team there when I was a child. And so the if I try to remember who played for the, the, the team back then, the 1978 roster of the Cleveland Indians interferes with my uh, memory of the 1976 Cleveland Indians. And so that would be a retroactive uh, interference. So how can we enhance memory? Well, uh, a couple things you can do. One is rehearsal, and that's the conscious repetition of information. So this is like memorizing the times tables when you were a kid. So two times two is four. Uh, uh, two times three is six. <laughs> I don't want really to get these wrong. Uh, two times four is eight, and on and on and on. Chunking is when you organize information into manageable bits or chunks. And so it's like trying to remember a telephone number. 10 digits would be difficult to remember, but three chunks is manageable. So like the area code and then the first three numbers and the last four. Elaborative rehearsal is thinking about the meaning of new information and its relation to knowledge already stored in memory. So you can use this for learning names. So my last name is Hatala. And so you might picture me with a hat on my head, hat, Hatala. And then even if you can't remember Hatala, you could greet me with, hey, hat man. And then I would think we were great friends because you're calling me hat man, even though you can't remember my name. So picture me with a hat on. Mnemonic devices are memory aids that help us organize information for encoding. 
So you can see several there to the right. You can think of homes in order to remember the Great Lakes or Roy G. Biv uh, to remember the um, spectrum. Uh, every good boy deserves fudge. Uh, if you can't remember the mnemonic though, it kind of defeats the purpose. How can we study effectively? Now you tell me. In chapter eight, when the class is half over, now you're gonna tell me how to study effectively. So I hear you saying that. One thing you can do is use elaborative rehearsal. And so information we process uh, more deeply goes into long-term memory, so make it meaningful. Again, a theme of the chapter. Apply the self-reference effect. Make the material you're studying personally meaningful to, or relevant to you. Overlearning can help prevent storage decay. Remember the forgetting curve. So go over your notes again right before the test and rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. So don't cram. Spaced practice, uh, which means studying over time, it helps rats learn mazes and it can help you learn psychology. And then finally, keep things in perspective, folks. It's just a test. I always tell my students that their grade isn't a measure of how intelligent they are or how much I like them because in my heart, they're all A students. And that is 100% the truth. Let's finish up by saying that all your problems, at least all your APA problems, can easily be solved with my Learn APA style book. So when you want to learn to write correctly or write right, consult my book and videos, which are also on YouTube, on uh, Learn APA style. And those are about writing in psychology and the social sciences.